Okay. So it's the sections two, four, and six. Uh, October tooth today. All right. So here is the main class portal again. And if you look at the content here, yeah. and the second document is the course plan. You can download that. And when you do, it is going to look like this. And just to see, let's get our bearings here. All right. First thing is, if you look at this table right here, this explains the course, uh, the marks weight distribution of the whole course. So all labs are worth 50%. Each quiz is worth 5% of the total course mark. And it just so happens that this is week five, October 2nd to October 6th, Monday to Friday. And it says we, uh, it says quiz. And the quiz is going to be on the content that was presented from week one to four, it's going to be 10 questions. It's going to be an online quiz, open book with unlimited time set up. And uh, I'm going to provide you the details for that. So just keep looking for the email. I'm going to deploy the quiz later on today. And it's worth 5% of the quiz. Now, the, let's look at the calendar here. October 2nd today. Now, it's a short quiz, just 10 questions. So two days should be enough to complete that quiz. Normally, you get about one hour to complete that, and people complete this thing in a time that's way shorter than that. However, I'm going to give you an unlimited time for that open book quiz online. Two days to do that. But... I just thought, why not? We can extend that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. By the end of Monday, the quiz is going to be closed. And if somebody forgets to write the quiz, I'm sorry, but um, there is no extension dates for whatever reason. That's it. You have two days to do this. Extended. I cannot say that the quiz can be done or should be done on Thursday and Friday because this week, Thursday and Friday, there is no school. So officially, this is not the date to write the quiz. However, because I'm extending the date, if you choose to write that during those days, you can. All right. But the official time is two days. All right. And it's going to be closed Monday night. All right. So look for the details uh, for that. All right, that's pretty much it as far as the kind of announcements. And let's go and move to the lecture that we're going to have today. And da -da -da. There we go. So boxes and devices, boxes and, sorry, I touched the mic stand here. Boxes and devices is the topic of today's lesson. Now, it says part one of two. That's for your, uh, that's for the information when you download, when you download the um, posted lecture notes, that's for my students, for Fancha College. Uh, if you're just watching this thing on YouTube, there will be no part two posted on YouTube because in our college this year, it just happens to be that part two is going to be conducted in person, in class. But it's not going to be conducted tomorrow because tomorrow there will be no class for, the, um, uh, for our course only. All the other classes, I don't know. But because of the quiz, Use that time to write the quiz. You can. Usually the quiz is written during class. 
So I have to give you the time for that. Uh, so you can use that to study for the quiz. You can use that to write the quiz. But then again, that time is designated for that. So that means there will be no in-person class tomorrow, which is Tuesday, October 3rd. All right, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's carry on with the class, shall we? All right, so of course, this is the funny part. Uh, if you see bo a box like that, don't admit that you have done it. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, it's a spaghetti type of a thing. Somebody along the way, when they're in their travels, they saw that and they took a picture. Sometimes you're going to end up doing this kind of thing, just for your own satisfaction kind of a thing. Um, somebody took the picture and they posted somewhere. This is what not to do. Way, way too many wires. So we are mentioning here CEC, Canadian Electrical Code, because we are in Canada and we're going to go by the Canadian standards here. Wherever you end up in the world, you're going to have to uh, obey the standards that are, well, that are posted and um, determined in whatever place in the world you are. They are going to be pretty much similar to each other because, you know, we live on the same planet and electricity is electricity. However, we're going to deal with CEC. Now, this is not a code class. You have other classes uh, with teachers that teach you the codes. However, once in a while, we're going to have to mention the code, even though we are not teaching it. All right. So CEC determines the amount of wires an electrical box can hold. And this would not be it. This would be way too many wires in the box. This is not legal. Uh, at least in Canada. Uh, all right, so the CEC determines the amount of wires an electrical box can hold based upon the following things, the following criteria. One of them is, well, the total volume of the box, and it's mentioned in milliliters. Uh, one milliliter is a liter divided by a thousand. So it's milliliters is the volume that is specified. It's a metric system because uh, we are in Canada. Now, following the uh, uh, in the following slides, uh, well, let's see. You're going to have another funny thing going on when it comes to metric and imperial system. All right. So how big is the box and how big are the wires that we're fitting in? All right. So the total volume of the box in milliliters and the size of the wires in American wiring gauge. The type and size of the device mounted. So that's another criteria. So how big is the box? How thick are the wires? And how big is the device that's in the box? For example, a switch or GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupt device. Please remind me to explain to you what GFCI is, and I want to do this thing during the in-person class. I don't want this, I don't I just don't want to do this thing online. If I have the opportunity to do this in person, I will. I just want to have the eye contact with you just to make sure that the understanding is there and if there's something that I need to add or expand upon or elaborate, I will. I just want to make sure that you guys understand uh, with some of the basic stuff about the basic electrical devices. So, and that, so this is one of the criteria, the type of the size of the devices. A switch is has smaller, if I can say, guts in, than GFCI. GFCI is a bulkier 
device. So of course, this is going to take more space in the box once you put in once you put that thing in the box. And of course, the number of wire connectors in the mm, yeah the wire the number of wire connectors used in the box that should be eliminated that in. All right. So we have the criteria now. Let's take a look at some things here. Here's a table 23 of CEC, Canadian Electrical Code. Number of conductors in boxes. All right. In this part here, we have the type of boxes. Here we have the corresponding volume that the boxes uh, possess or have. And here is how many wires you can fit in them. Let's take a look at some of that uh, here. Um, square box, for example, oct well, octagonal box, which has eight angles, eight sides. Eight equal sides, octagon box. So that means only one side has to be specified, same as the square box. Only one side has to be specified because a square is a square. So this one here, this box is four in, so he, see, we're specifying the volume in milliliters because we are metric, but the box sizes we are specifying in inches. There we go. Here's our metric system. Uh, so <clears throat> square box, four by inch and a half. How do we read that? The last dimension of the box is the depth of the box. Sometimes you're going to have more numbers and the last one is the depth. So a square box, four by inch and a half, which means the box size is four inches by four inches by four inches by four inches. So only one side has to be specified because it's a square box. And the other one, the other dimension is depth. The last number is the depth. All right. Now here's a round box. We're only specifying one side of the round box, right? Well, hmm, box has the round box has no side. So it's a round shape. So we are specifying the diameter of that. So a round box, four inches diameter, half inch deep. Okay, then there are the device boxes with different size of the different length of the sides. So three by two, three by two, three by two, three by two, four by two, and so on. So let's say this is the well, this is the long side, this is the short side, and this is the depth. So three inches by two inches. By the way, the three by two is the size of the utility box that we have used already during our lab two. That's the size of it, three by two. And the two, by the way, the two here tells us that this is a single gang box. But let's take care of that in the next couple of slides. Uh, what's the next column in the table? It is the capacity in milliliters or in brackets cubed inches. All right. So let's say three by two by two device box. Three inches long side, two inches short side, two inches deep. If you do the calculation of the volume of that, that was going to translate into 163 milliliters of the volume of the box, which also translates into 10 cubed inches. Now, let's see what that can have inside. It can fit six 14 gauge wires, three by two by two. Of course, if the wires are thicker, which would be gauge 12, remember, 
the number of the gauge goes down, the wire becomes thicker. Right? So three by two by two, it can hold six 14 gauge, 14 gauge wires. It can hold five thicker wires, gauge 12. It can hold four even thicker wires, gauge 10. And if we increase the thickness, then we lose the ability to fit wires because the thicker the wire, the more volume it contains. So that's how you read this table here based on the type of the box, its capacity, and the number of conductors um, that you can fit in the box. Now, you probably have noticed by now in your code class that by the time you get comfortable with navigating or reading the Canadian Electrical Code book, it's almost like studying a law. All right. It's almost like trying to become a lawyer. It employs the same parts of your brain. So you can go to court and represent someone. Here is so-and-so, and I am his electrician. Yeah, there we go. Oh. <clears throat> it's Monday. All right. Now let's look at table 22. What does that show us? Space for conductors in boxes. It's basically how much space each conductor needs or how much space each conductor is going to occupy. So a length of 14 gauge wire needs to have 24.6 milliliters. 12 needs more. 10 gauge needs even more. 8 and 6, you see the number, the gauge number goes down, which means that wires become thicker, that means they will need more space allocated within the box. But what is a conductor? I'm just going to begin that page and the rest you can go as deep as you want or as deep as you need when it, times, when it comes time to the term the, to finding out whether you are legal when it comes to fitting so many wires in the box. I'm just going to get your thinking started and you can continue later on as you go along. All right, so maximum number of conductors in the box. Well, here's a statement. Box shall be of sufficient size to provide usable space for all insulated conductors contained in the box, based on following, subjects to following. A, a conductor running through a box with no connection therein shall, well, therein is a big word, shall be considered as one conductor. Okay. Where are we here? There we go. There's my board. I'm just gonna erase that. That's from previous class. All right, so we have a box, whatever the box is. And there's a wire. In the pipe, there's a pipe, okay, going into the box, and here's another pipe, and here's another pipe, and whatever, right? And there's a wire going here, and it just keeps going in that pipe somewhere else. This wire that is in the box, it's not connected to anything, it's just passing through the box. What does it say? A conductor running through a box with no connection shall be therein shall be called considered as one. So we're counting that as one conductor. All right, let's keep going. Each conductor entering or leaving a box and connected to a terminal or a connector 
within the box shall be considered as one conductor. Okay. Let's get our board again. Let's say there is some device mounted in there's that whatever screw terminal here and a screw terminal here. All right, so now we have this wire running through the box and we're considering this thing as one conductor. But if we cut the wire, just get this thing eraser a little bit bigger. Let's say we cut the wire. And one end is going to be connected to this terminal. And that end is going to be connected. Oops. And that end is going to be connected to this terminal. Now we are counting that as two. Right? Let's just review this thing again. Each conductor entering or leaving the box entering or leaving the box. So here's a conductor entering or leaving the box. And here's another conductor entering or leaving the box. Each conductor entering or leaving the box and connected to a terminal or connector within the box shall be considered as one conductor, which means we have one and two conductors out of that one right now. So we're counting that as two. All right. Uh, a conductor of which part? Sorry, a conductor of which no part leaves the box shall not be counted. What else should not be counted? And Number 18 or 16 gauge fixture wires supplying a luminaire. Luminaire is a light fixture mounted on the box. So you see you have a light fixture mounted on the box. And out of that light fixture, there are going to be a couple of wires. So you can come, so they are internally connected to the light bulbs. And they're entering the box. They are not counted as wires. Right. So there are two statements here. C, a conductor of which part no leaves, sorry, conductor of which no part leaves the box shall not be counted. So what we have here, uh, um, let's say there's another kind of a device here or whatever, and there's another terminal, and there's a terminal, and that, uh, Oh, there's a wire connecting these two terminals, so no end leaves the box. That means we are not counting this as a wire. It's just we're ignoring the count of that. So between this situation and that such, it balances out, right? Uh, let's say we have a box. And we have a, I don't know. A pigtail, that will be a, well, uh, that is connecting three wires. And there's another pigtail that is con, uh, connecting two wires by the uh, wire nut or moret. And then we insert on one more wire that connecting those two pigtails. All right, so there's more wires here. Also that wire will not be counted because no end of that wire leaves the box. That's the rule that they are. And of course, light fixtures, what does that mean? Um, there's a ceiling and there is electrical box in there, in the ceiling, device box, and there's a wire provided to it. And there's a light fixture with some light bulbs happening here, okay? These are light bulbs. And those light bulbs are connected, 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 and there's a couple wires coming in that are going to be connected to the conductors here. Those wires, these wires that are coming, uh, 
these wires here that are coming from the light bulbs entering the box, that's what that means. These wires are not counted, right? So here's the second statement here. And what's not counted? Uh, the wire that no part of the wire leaves the box is not counted. And the usually there are 18 or 16 gauge, gauge wires, uh, sup, uh, fixture wire supplying the luminary, luminary the light fixture mounted on the box containing. So these are the wires that are not counted. And there is so much more here that, you know what, we're not going to, because I don't want you to fall asleep. I almost fell asleep saying that. All right. Wow. Um, what do we do? Uh, we're gonna, okay, now let's take a look at what some of the device boxes looks like. Look like right. single gang device box three by two by okay. Remember, the last one always tells you the depth of the box, and these are the dimension of the device box three by two, two and a half inches deep, three by two. Okay, now. This two inches side, that says it's a single gang box. Single gang. It's two inches wide. That two inches size means it's a single gang. If you were a double gang box, it would be a wider box. It would be four inches instead of two inches here. Now, this box can fit eight 14 gauge wires and still be legal. All right. So, going to the most common sizes and uses one, three by two by two and a half. Well, used in duplex receptacles and switches. Now, three by two by three, so it's half inch deeper. if you want to have a GFCI device in the receptacle. GFCI is a receptacle that is just like duplex receptacle, but it has some sensing circuitry uh, that will shut things down if there's electricity escaping to the ground. Usually if a water spills onto it, because water is conductive. So that's why we need to have those by water sources. So kitchen countertops, GFCIs, um, well, receptacles that are mounted by the water tap in the washrooms, they have to be GFCI protected. GFCI stands for Ground Fault Circuit Interrupt. Please remind me next time we see each other in person that I explain to you exactly how it works. I just don't want to do it here. I'm going to do it in person. Um, all right, so because it has some circuitry in there, that means that the guts of that receptacle are bigger and bulkier, which means we need to have a deeper box for that. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Front face of a box, it extends half inch in front of a stud for drywall. What does that mean? My board again. Let's erase and start fresh. All right, here's a wall. Wow, I can draw straight. And here is a receptacle in the wall, let's say for a switch, light switch. Okay. If we look at this thing sideways, because there would be studs, it's mounted on the stud. It goes from top to bottom and there's more studs. It's the framing. Let's say it's a timber framing. And over here, after the, this thing is mounted, the whole thing is going to be covered by a drywall. All right, so if we look at this thing, this particular thing sideways, we're gonna see a stud, 
and we're going to see a device box extended. And over this is the front, this is the back, okay? Of the, so here's the front, and there will be the back here. Uh, this is the front of the room, and this will be the kind of like a, you know, back side of the wall. So if this is the stud right here, this distance right here is half inch because once this thing cover is covered by a drywall, oops, the drywall is half inch thick. So that means that the, face, the front of the electrical box is going to be nice and flush with the surface of the drywall. So that's basically what that means here. Front, uh, front face of the box extends half inches in front of the stud for drywall. Now, if you look at this box here, you can see two kind of nipples sticking out right here. They are half inch from the face of the box. So just so you don't have to use a ruler and a marker, you're gonna lose a bunch of time. Just put that box and let that stop you, these here, up to this point, and you're going to have that box sticking out half inch, and that's what it looks like right here. And this face stands out half inch. So when things are covered by the drywall, um, things are nice and flush. All right, so is that the next? Uh, yeah, that's the next slide. Uh, all right, single box um, uh, with devices terminated. Well, here's a single pulse. Oh no, there's a three-way switch and here it looks like it's a four-way switch. These are switches, and that's basically a device that's terminated, a device that's terminated. We will talk about what three-way switch is and what four-way switch is or a single pulse switch, what, is, what it is later on. Uh, face plates, or also known as cover plates, single gang device box cover plates. Well, here is a basic simple uh, face plate or cover plate for a duplex receptacle <clears throat> excuse me and of course this would be a face plate that is designed for a switch all right two gang device box double gang box see two inches and two inches yeah. so Instead of being a two inch for a single gang box, it's four inches wide for a double gang box. And that box can contain 16 14 gauge conductors based on the criteria that we talked. Four inch square box, it can contain 14 of 14 gauge conductors. So it's not often used in residential wiring, exception for, with the exception of cable connections with no devices. So in other ways, uh, I would say this can serve, uh, quite often it serves as a passing through box or a junction box. And here's an example of a junction box four inch square box used as a connection point for a circuit. There will be wires coming out here and there will be, this will be like a feeder wire maybe. And then uh, two branches branch out of that and the connections are being made. And the face plate is basically a cover plate, blank cover plate is basically slapped onto that and everybody happy. There we go. <laughs> Three gang box, triple gang box. Well, three inches because that's the same. That's, that remains. 
but we're going sideways here. So single gang box is two inches. Triple gang box would be like three single gang boxes side by side. One box, another box, another box. But out of those three, there's one box. So two, four, six, each two inches. So of course, it's going to be three inches by six inches. And this one happens to be two and a half inches deep. This box can contain, you can fit 24 14 gauge wires and be legal, still be legal. Here's a four gang box. As I said, previous class, we're going up to 72 gang. No, just kidding. Okay, we're going to stop at this four gang. But, you know, uh, where do you see those? Uh, well, in the classrooms, you can see a uh, you know, bunch of switches, switch gangs. Um, that's how things are being done. Right? To save space and make things nice and neat. So four gang box, three by eight, of course. Yeah. It can contain, you can fit 32 14, in, 14 gauge wires and still be legal. All right, different kinds of boxes. This would be a plastic box and the boxes, device boxes, not only are made for um, electrical conductors or service type of uh, connections. This will be a service connection here, providing power. But all the other ones seem to be signal type of wires. Right? This is a common thing for uh, you know the back of a flat screen TV, maybe. All right? Now, here's another example of a similar thing. Uh, you can have those. If you're interested in doing something like that, I can point you to the appropriate distributors uh, that uh, that you can buy things from. And if you want to do this thing for your home or if you want to do this thing for clients, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, talk to me. I will point you in the right direction. Right? Okay. Ganga ball boxes. So they are boxes that can be ganged together in a pinch. Because, of course, if you have to have a lot of um, points and uh, a lot of locations and, uh, well, in, the, in, your, in your project, so let's say the project calls for 24 uh, quadruple gang boxes, you're not going to do that. You're going to buy ready-made four gang boxes but sometimes if you're in a pinch and if you don't have that and you just want to complete the job uh, it's a good idea to have in your van or your working van uh, some of the gang ball boxes so you can make any kind of a gang box out of this one by because those are designed in a way that you can remove one side you can remove the sides from each side and join that. So you remove this side from that box, remove that side from this box, join them together, and you get double gang box out of two single gang boxes. So these are called gangable boxes. And that's what it looks like after it's done. They are made to do that. Right? Of course, it takes time. So you would not have that thing planned to be used in a larger projects project that requires a larger amount of those multiple gang boxes you would just buy ready made but as i said sometimes you're in a pinch so you could do that so it's always a good idea to have that in your van Ooh. other type of a device this is something that's called an f clip because it looks like an F, letter F. Usually what you do, you mount the boxes here. Here's one box. Maybe there's some other device box that you're going to mount. But usually before the drywall is put on in a new construction, you tend to mount the boxes to the studs. However, 
after the drywall is put in and if you're doing a retrofit job or somebody called you to add one boxes because they wanted to have some they want to have something somewhere and you're going to be required to put a box between the studs so it's, the box is going to rest on the drywall what do you do you fish the wires, let's say it's from the basement, you fish the wires through that and just pull it up to here and just pull it through. But you still need to mount the box. What do you do? You use something like the F-clips. And the best thing I can do is suggest that you Google F-clip right, or F-strap how to blah 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 and i think there's one of the first things that's going to pop is a video that lasts i think um i think it's a less than a minute video showing you how those things are used and uh, those are really smart things oh somebody who invented that is probably a millionaire and they should be uh, beautiful thing Sometimes it makes the job possible at all. Right? So that's how you use, there are some different devices for you to use. Uh, if you're in a, well, I don't want to say in a pinch because I'll be repeating this thing a lot. Uh, but um, mm, these are devices, different devices that can be used in different situations. All right. Common devices used with gang boxes. Single gang, double gang, triple gang, and so on. That's what means the gang boxes. There's a single pole switch or a duplex receptacle. We already studied the anatomy of the duplex receptacle, just a simple duplex receptacle. We haven't talked about what a single pole switch is, and we will later on. However, I'm just going to start you up. Erase. Pencil. Come on. Pencil. All right. Let's say there's a terminal. There's a wire. A terminal. And there's a wire. And here is a pole. The pole is single. And it has a single throw. It can connect to this point or not. It can be thrown on a single in a single type of a way. So this would be single pole, single throw. Right. Now, if we if we add some more terminals here. in the same switch and there's another pole and usually they are mechanically interconnected this would be well double pole single throw get it there's another possibility you can have a wire with a terminal, and there's another terminal, and there's another terminal with wires coming out of there. And here is a pole that can become can connect this common point to, to this terminal or that terminal. Well, this would be called single pole uh, 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 oh well double throw switch so a single pole switch over there that is mentioned is that single pole over here single pole switch usually look uh, it's used to control lights in your bedroom or whatnot Okay, what do we do? What do we have here? 
a duplex receptacle has a has the brass side tap removed in order to make a split receptacle. Remember when we played with the receptacle in our thing? I explained to you that there is a tap here that connects these two screws. So it doesn't matter which screw you connect the wire to, <clears throat> it powers up both receptacles. However, if you take needle nose pliers and just yank that out, by breaking the connection between these two screws, then these two receptacles become independent. You can leave the neutral side connected together because that's a return path for the current. And you can provide electricity, you can provide service or power to those individually, to those separate, separated circuits individually from a separate circuit breakers. Uh, okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so this would be a for example, 14.3, because we has three, he has through three, um, uh, three current carrying conductors. Right? And one safety wire, ground or bond. The, as I said, the neutral can be left intact, connecting these two, so you only have to provide one wire. It's a return path. And these two separate hot wires are connected separately to the um, to each individual hot terminals of this duplex receptacle. That's why we call it a split receptacle. Used quite often in kit on kitchen countertop by the kitchen countertops. The reason for that is you want uh, you know we want more power going there, more current. Uh, because the kitchen countertops are used more heavily, especially in the morning uh, when everybody wakes up and everybody gets ready to work, to school, blah, blah, blah. So there is toaster, coffee maker, and whatnot going all at the same time. And if you just have one regular duplex receptacle connected to a single 15 amp source, it is going to put that into an overload. It's going to try to draw too much current. So that's why we need to have so uh, what happens what's being done is quite often those things are split and there's a requirement. So those hot terminals here and here, sorry, there's a sneeze coming at some point. If I blow up, uh, just excuse me. Uh, uh, so this, they can be pulled, the power can be pulled from two separate circuit breakers and sometimes it's being upped with uh, two separate circuit breakers. Oh, no, sorry. So it's being upped with the gauge of the wire. There is one thing that I can right away, I can see there is something wrong with this based on what we were talking about uh, in the lab. What I showed you what not to do. There is something wrong, seriously wrong with one of the pictures, and I wonder if anybody can spot that. So jump, oh, there we go, Cameron, got it, all right? Pinch insulation, pinched insulation, all right? Uh, so that's how the split receptacle, and sometimes it's apt with the gauge of the wire, so not only it's two separate circuits, but they're capable of 20 amps each instead of, 15 amps each. And then you can have quite a bit of a comfort going on in the kitchen. Now, most common uses countertop receptacles in the kitchen and split switched receptacles in the living spaces. Well, yeah, 
Uh, that's also another use. I'm not sure how popular that is. Uh, you can, because sometimes it causes confusion. You can have a split receptacle and one of them, let's say the, well, the top one is connected straight to a circuit breaker. Um, and you can plug in your TV in there. But the bottom one, which comes from another circuit breaker, through a switch and you can have like a desk lamp connected so you can control that lamp from a switch that's on the wall that controls that. Uh, sometimes people do that. Okay. Now, here is, well, forget the GFCI part. We're going to explain what that is, because, but that's a GFCI, you can tell it's a GFCI circuit, but let me explain that, what GFCI is um, in class. This one is 20 amps, this one is 15 amps. Those two have different ampacity, and ampacity is the ability to conduct current. And since current is measured in amps or amperes, uh, then, um, well, ampacity is the measure of how many amps you can put through that. So, how much current can. So, this receptacle is capable of providing 20 amps. This one is capable of providing 15 amps. What's different is the footprint. See that? Yeah. This footprint versus this footprint right here. This one has a little sideways slot going on there. For a load, like for example, a con an air wall mounted air conditioning unit, most of those are pulling 20 amps and the load is not asking, excuse me, mister, can I have 20 amps? No, it says, I'm going to draw 20 amps, whether you can give it to me or not. So if you plug it into a circuit that is only capable of providing 15 amps, it's going to overload that and the circuit breaker is going to flip. So you need to up the ampacity by installing a switch with a different footprint, and you need to run a wire that is capable of handling 20 amps instead of 15 amps, so the wire has to be thicker, and the gauge would be 12 at least. Okay, So then that device will have a plug that will have that prong in this made in this way so you can't even plug it in to a regular 15 amp circuit you will have to have that right so the difference of that is the footprint and here is a chart of different footprints of different um ampacities as far as the receptacles go right. Right, you're going to have this thing available for download very soon. I'm going to activate the download for that. And that's pretty much it for, for today. Just remember to look for the test announcement um, and the details will be explained to you in detail. You have detailed details. Okay, kids, what day is today? It's almost Friday, even though it's Monday. Because as I say, every day is almost Friday. It's that some days are almost there than the others. Okay, cool. I'll see you when I see you. Thank you for your attention and have a wonderful week. Excuse me? Yes. Yeah, I have a question here. Just okay. I wondering to know where I can find the quiz when you talk about it in... Uh... Uh, when we start. Yeah. So I'm going to send you an email with the explanation of how to get there. It's going to be quite easy. Uh, if you still don't, uh, if you still can't, see, but you should be able to. If you still have a problem, just send me an email, okay? Because i opening the quiz and uh, say it's, it's and... not there yet. It's not there yet. I haven't, I haven't activated that yet. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. It's no. today, just today, yeah? Yeah, but I'm extending the deadline. So if officially it's two days because yeah. I, I can't say that uh, I can't give you assignment for the time uh, there's no school. 
So it's two days for 10 questions. A quiz should be more than enough, but I'm extending it to next Monday. Anyways, just so if you know. If we are late, we lose a mark. Oh, if you're late, the you get zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank cool. you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you. No problem.